Good morning. It's a Monday morning. You're watching Trading R. I'm Reema Tendulkar. With me is Sonal Boothra. And it's turning out to be a solid Monday morning. Uh, we opened, we had a gap up opening. The Nifty was up about 60, 65 points at the opening take. But it was all about the banks, yeah. right? It was only the Nifty Bank which was powering through with a gain of more than 1%. While the frontline indices were up, what, 0.3, 0.4%. Then at 9.45, that intraday chart comes up. The markets dipped into the red. Yeah. Very briefly, but in the red. And now as we speak, it's a 200-point gain on the Nifty. The Nifty is at 24,400 and the Sensex has gained close to about 400 points. And it's not just about the banks. Oil and gas names are doing well. PSUs are higher. Pharma has a gain of about a half a percent IT. So pretty much, you know, the rest of the sectors too are now participating in this rebound that we're seeing after last week's carnage. And you know, unless there's a big miss, there are no massive earnings reactions that we are seeing or it's really good for banks instance. Yeah. You know, you a lot of banks from the broader markets or from the Nifty Pack, be it ICICI Bank, then we have Shriram Finance as well, which is reacting to numbers. So it's a very stock-specific, yet a very sector-specific market. As Reema pointed out, even the oil and gas names are doing well. We have the PSU Banking Index, which is the biggest gainer right now. We also have Nifty Metals Index, which has made a comeback. And the Auto Index, uh, after the weakness that we saw in the last couple of trading sessions, is in the green right now. The Small Cap Index, too, is making a comeback. So that uh, index is up 1%. While the mid-cap index is up around 9 tenths of a percent. So we have a lot of earnings to track and ahead of Diwali, maybe some pullback that we are seeing. We don't know whether that would continue or not. But despite the mixed handover that we got from Wall Street and Asian markets, it's looking like a good screen so far. Though Nifty still has come off around 60 points from the highs of the day as we speak. So we'll keep tracking that for you. But uh, let's talk about some corporate conversations. Embassy Office Parks reported a good set of quarter two numbers with revenue up 12%. Occupancy is coming in at an eight-quarter high as well. We have with us Arvind Maya, the CEO of Embassy REIT, to discuss their second quarter earnings and most importantly, the outlook going forward. Arvind, good morning. Thank you so much for joining in. Well, you know, you have already increased your leasing guidance by 16% to 6.5 million square feet for FY25. Do you think there's a possibility you will upgrade your, exceed your NOI guidance and the dividend per unit guidance as well? Because you have already achieved 50% of both of them. Good morning, Sonal. I think uh, to start off with, it been a great quarter, a first half year for us, and it's all about, as I say, growth. Uh, what I mean is our portfolio has increased by almost 3 million square feet, completed portfolio in the last 12 months, and occupancy has increased by 4% to 90% by value for the first time post-COVID. And also we have a lot of development coming up and the rents are growing. So overall, very positive. And coming specific specifically to your question, you are right, we have already achieved 4 million square feet of lease up in the first half and we've guided to 6.5 million. And my sense will largely be in the range what we have said, but I think in terms of distributions, most likely we'll be at the higher end of the range what we've given by the end of the year. Okay, so um, you're maintaining your guidance, but you could be closer to the upper end. That's what yes, you're that's saying. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Uh, on this leasing guidance, uh, because you've done so well, though you're not raising it as of now, What's leading to it? Is it better pipeline? Is it new order wins? Actually, Rima, we've increased the guidance. So we started the year at 5.6 million square feet as the guidance. And based on our first half, where we've done 4 million already, we've increased it now to 6.5 million square feet. Now that's uh, overall, if you see the market is doing very well. In the first nine months of this calendar year, the India market has done about 50 million square feet of absorption, gross absorption. And by the end of this calendar year, it's expected that we'll touch 70 million square feet. That's going to be the record uh, historically for All India because previously it was 60 million square feet pre-COVID. And a lot of this demand is coming from you know, global captives. We've spoken about it quite extensively in the past. More and more existing companies growing, more and more new companies coming. Just to uh, state one fact, I think today there are about 23% of Fortune 500 companies which have set up captive centers in India that number is expected to go up to 43% by 2030. So more and more new companies coming and taking up space, that's what is leading to more demand. Okay. Uh, you know, Arvind, I just wanted to understand, you did 8 million square feet of leasing in FY24. Now you're saying 6.5 million square feet. Uh, will this be the early trend going forward? Do you think FY24 was a peak in terms of leasing? And uh, my, my colleague meant to ask if it's 4 million square feet in first half. Do you think, uh, uh, why do you think you'll not be able to do as good in the second half as well? You've, of course, upgraded your leasing guidance, but do you think you can do better than that in that case? Actually, that's a good question, Sonal. It also depends on how much stock you have, right? So what ha what's happened is last year we did eight. 
this year we are looking at six and a half and at some point in time we kind of reached the stabilized occupancy by the end of this year if you see uh based on our own projections we'll be at 92 percent occupancy by value and historically the stable occupancy is considered as 95 percent so as you reach that number of 95 then you'll kind of peak out in terms of what supply you have so what then the next mm. question which comes is how do you grow right so in terms of existing portfolio we have a good 8 million square feet under construction as we speak and of that uh, in the next two years 5 million square feet to be delivered 71 percent is already pre-leased right so what that means is as a management team we now need to look at grow inorganically we'll have to acquire more assets that's when our team will have more stock to lease mm. uh, you've secured a 13 percent rent escalation on 1.4 million square feet of leasing what about the rest? Is there scope for more rent escalations in the rest of the year? Yeah, Rima, I think we have close to another 4 million square feet, which is due for escalation in the next six months. So that's more or less, I mean, we had rent escalating even during the peak of COVID. So that's a inbuilt organic growth, which is there for us. So that will continue to grow during the rest of the year and years. Okay. So you spoke about the targeted occupancy at around 95%, right? That, that is by when? So, uh, you know, without giving exact precise dates, Sonal, I think we are looking at reaching that stabilized occupancy probably in the next four to six quarters max. Okay, four to six quarters that would be. Uh, so, are you saying the SEZ vacancy issues, they are behind us completely? What was the vacancy number from just the SEZ portfolio this time? You know, the way to look at it, Sonal, now is there's no need to look at SEZ, non-SEZ because mm -hmm. after this new regulatory change, thanks to government, any non-SEZ SEZ space, Either you could denotify a full building or even demarcate floor by floor. So effectively, we are leasing all space as if it's non-SEZ. So in the last 12 months, we have actually denotified and demarcated close to 5 million square feet of SEZ to non-SEZ. And overall put together, while the occupancy is, say, 90%, the non-SEZ is more like 92-93% occupancy. All right, Arvind, uh, always a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining in today with your take on what's happening in the industry and with Embassy REIT as well. That's the word coming in from the management, sounding very bullish, and they have increased their leasing guidance as well, and they will achieve the upper end of the guidance that they've given on their distribution per unit and NOI as well. Well, it's time to talk and focus on some important earnings now uh, that came over the weekend. ICICI Bank's results beat estimates. Numbers showed an outstanding performance versus its peers. Abhishek Kothari is here to give us the key highlights. Uh, While well, ICICI Bank has outperformed its peers, that is the other large private banks, especially on the loan growth, deposit growth, uh, bringing down the gross NPA ratio as well. Uh, the gross NPA ratio has come down below 2%, which is the lowest in last 10 years. So what has worked for them is that the asset quality is best in last 10 years. Now gross NPA ratio is below the 2%. Mark net NPA ratio remains steady at 0.42%. Operating efficiency is one of the best that you are seeing in last seven quarters. Cost to income ratio is now down to 38.6% versus 39.65% in the previous quarter. The analyst slippage ratio is at 15 quarter low coming in at 1.59% uh, versus 1.93%. You have seen slippages rise for majority of the lenders on a sequential basis but for ICSI Bank it's improved. Uh, quarterly subsidiary spat is at all time high of more than 2,600 crore. This is led by ICSI Securities Primary uh, which has reported massive rise in profitability on a sequential basis. What has not worked in the result is that the net interest margin is at nine quarter low domestic net interest margin is at nine quarter low now loan growth although being healthy at 15 percent yoy but the standard that icsi bank has set uh, this is at 14 quarter row write off has remained elevated at more than 3300 crore which is perhaps the highest that you are seeing in last 11 quarters both their uh, NI and pat is a beat on our poll back to you okay Thank you very much for that. And what about Sriram Finance? That's the big mover in the Nifty Pack. What went so right for them? You take a look at the two comparison. One Chola and one Sriram. Chola saw almost, uh, you know, flattish kind of a dispersal growth this time around. While on the other hand, Shiram saw a 6% jump in the dispersals and that led to, you know, a good uh, performance from them overall. Asset quality for them has improved. Gross NP ratio is down to 5.3% versus 5.4% in the previous quarter. The entire Shiram group, this is the best asset quality that I've seen from them in last 10 years or even more. Net interest margin continued to decline. Two key factors over here. 
they have been slowing down on the gold and personal loan portfolio, which are high yielding products. So that has put the pressure on net interest margin. It's down to 8.74% versus 8.79% in the previous quarter. The disbursals are strong at 15.5% YOI and about 6% sequentially. The AM growth has remained healthy for them at almost 20% YOI and about 4% sequentially. With reference to our poll, uh, the NI has come in at 5,607 crores. We were working with a number of 5,457 crores. They have reported a profit of 2,071 crores, while we were working with a number of 2,077 crores. Back to you. Okay, all right. Those are uh, the updates coming in on the earnings that we got over the weekend. It's time for a short break. Up next, the management of Inox Wind will join in to discuss quarter two earnings. The quarter gone by was strong for the company. Stay tuned for that conversation. Welcome back. Let's talk commodities. Manisha is now joining in. Manisha, what are you looking at? Thank you for that, Reema. I'm looking at the crude oil prices because it's a very sharp decline that we are working with onto this one. Well, remember, last week was a 4% of gain for the crude oil prices, but today in the Asian markets, it has been a 4.5% of a decline in the initial opening markets itself. So with that, we are trading at a two-week close when it comes to the crude oil prices. If you look at it this year on how the crude prices have been, well, it has been a negative one, 4.5% of decline for WTI and 6% down for Brent prices in this year until now. If you look at the highs and the lows in this year as well, you'll realize that we are on the lower side of the range at this point in time. So when you look at the Brent crude oil prices, well, we have seen a high of $91 in this year and we are trading at around $72 at this point in time. We also have seen prices go below $70 at one point in time as well. Same goes for the WTI crude price also. From $87 of a high in this year to $68 is where we are trading at this point in time. So double-digit decline from its highs of 2024. Well, the major reason for the cutoff or sell-off that we saw today morning was because Israel's strike against Iran over the weekend has been less severe than expected. Israel clearly has averted the nuclear and the oil facilities within Iran, and that has taken that premium off the prices. Apart from that, it also has been about the OPEC and IEA cutting their demand growth expectations for this year and the next as well. And the markets are looking at OPEC to increase production from the 1st of December. The next meeting that the OPEC and allies will do is only on 1st of December. So until then, it is going to be status quo perhaps coming in from that agency. And then markets also are reacting to the U.S. production, which is near all-time highs. The China's shift from diesel to EV and uh, electric vehicles has been another reason that you are looking at demand perhaps peaking out there. And then dollar index trading above 104 has led uh, most of the dollar-denominated commodities under pressure there. When you talk about the outlook then in 2025, not too many global banks and brokerages believe that you could be looking at higher prices from here. We are anyway trading at around 72, and that is the average for the next year now. Goldman Sachs and UBS are talking about 77 to 75. 75 actually seems like a powered point for a lot of banks and brokerages. Bank of America and JP Morgan also believe that 75 is perhaps uh, the, uh, the average that you could see for the Brent crude oil prices in 2025. We have similar statements also coming in from HSBC, and there are even lower targets coming in from Wells Fargo at $70 a barrel. Most uh, bearish, of course, coming in from City. They believe that the demand will decline, supplies will increase, the China's demand will not come back. And once the war premium also goes away, you could perhaps be looking at $60 a barrel of a price in next year. Okay, 
sixty dollars a barrel. That would be a dream come true for a lot of these OMCs and other users as well, right? Thank you so much, Manisha, for joining us as always and making sense of what's happening in the commodity space, specifically here in the crude oil market. With that, let's move on. Um, Inox Wind reported a strong set of quarter two results. The company reported a revenue increase of ninety eight percent, and they have increased their EBITDA margin guidance as well. So to talk about the second quarter numbers and the outlook going ahead. We have Mr. Devansh Jain, the Executive Director, Inox GFL Group, joining in now. Devansh, good morning. Thank you so much for joining in. Um, you know, you have increased the margin guidance from 15% to 17%. Of course, you have spoken about moderation in margins going forward, but there's an increase in EBITDA uh, margin guidance. Can you give us a sense of what led to this confidence of increasing your EBITDA margin guidance? And is there an updated execution guidance and revenues as well? Hi, good morning, uh, Sonal. Uh, good to be back on CNBC. You know, so we've upgraded guidance because Q1 and Q2 have been fairly strong for us. You're right, Q3 and Q4 will kind of normalize that. But we've upgraded guidance from 15 to 17 percent, with the caveat there could be further increases to this due to a couple of factors. One, uh, royalty payments subside from FY26. Two, there's been a lot of backward integration and strategic actions which we've been taking such as uh, backward integrating into having our own cranes. Uh, we've gone into uh, strategic sourcing, tolling of transformers. And third, I think as we move forward, we'll have next year our Forex turbine being launched as well as larger blades. So for the coming financial year, I think we're on, we're on a strong wicket, but we've certainly upgraded guidance uh, to 17% with the caveat that this could further increase in the coming financial year. Uh, but Devansh, can you tell us what you expect in the second half of the year in terms of margins? Because Q1 margins were 21.3%, Q2 margins were 23.6%, which means we're looking at an average of 22%. Uh, and your full year guidance is 17% plus. So clearly margins are going to drop off in second half. So explain the reasons for that. You know, Rima, it really doesn't matter with respect to what's happening on a quarterly basis. From a full year perspective, we had guided for 15%. As I mentioned, we've upgraded that to 17%. Now, uh, while Q1 and Q2 would have been higher, that's primarily because uh, typically H1 is, you know, from a seasonal perspective, it's le lesser execution on the ground. We've also done a, a larger chunk of supplies as, as opposed to uniform amount of EPC activity. And as we move forward into Q3 and Q4, while we've guided for about 800 megawatts of supplies in this financial year, and we've done about 280, so that's a very large amount of supply yet to come in in Q3, Q4. But you're going to have larger amount of execution happening on the ground as well. As a result of which, while supply margins are higher, EPC margins are slightly lower. So to that extent, you'll see a moderation on EPC on a, on a Q3, Q4 basis, but full year uh, still upgraded with respect to the guidance we've given up. Okay. So, you know, now what are the ordering trends looking like, Devansh? Are you saying plain vanilla, wind or hybrid auctions? Uh, what are the discovered prices that you're seeing right now? And is there better bidding in terms of players being less aggressive? What's the ground situation like right now? Look, I think the macroeconomic scenario is just uh, mind-boggling. Uh, we're looking at about 350 gigs by 2030. You've got a lot of green hydrogen eventually kicking in. Uh, the larger ambition being to get to about 500 gigs. Having said that, uh, I think where we are currently, we've seen about 12 gigawatts of ordering take place this year, which is a mix of hybrid, FDRE, and a little bit of plain vanilla wind. I think it's 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 more and more focused on hybrid and FDRE. Uh, there are about 10 gigawatts of bids which are already in the public domain, which we should see getting awarded over the next four to five months over this financial year. Uh, obviously, Q1 was an election quarter. So to that extent, you've seen a little bit of a, a hold up, but I think there's a lot of pent up demand. There's a lot of pent up order uh, uh, tenders which will still come out. So overall, I would tend to think this is only going to get larger and larger as we uh, keep moving forward. With respect to pricing, uh, you see, you've got a you've got a range from about three to say about uh, I would say four point five. So plain vanilla wind would be uh, you know closer to about three three and a half, depending on which state you are in. And then depending on whether you're talking of hybrid or whether you're talking of FDRE, pump storage, a little bit of battery, you'll see pricing moving up a little bit, a uh, little bit more than that. Okay. Uh, you spoke about how higher execution will result in margins moderating marginally in H2. 
Uh, so talking purely about your execution, you're maintaining your full year execution target, I believe, of 800 uh, megawatts for FY25. But for FY26, you're talking about a possibility that you will beat your guidance of 1200 uh, megawatts. Can you tell us what might lead to that? And you also have a 2 billion giga, uh, million watt uh, guidance for FI27. What happens to that? Look, you know, I think uh, we've been trying to uh, beat investor expectations, trying to beat analyst expectations every quarter. Uh, and I would tend to err on the side of caution. Uh, having said that, uh, while we have upgraded guidances, we have upgraded execution targets. Uh, over the past three or four quarters. At this point in time, we're sticking to the 1,200 megawatt guidance for FY26. Of course, there is a caveat that this could further be upgraded. It's simply driven by the fact that if you look at our order book, it's the highest ever order book we've had. It's about 3.3 .3 gigawatt. And at this point in time, we are in discussions and negotiations for some very, very large deals across the board with some of the largest IPPs, whether you know standards or IPPs and CNI customers. So as we move along, if you're going to see a larger and larger order book as we, as, as we move forward, obviously that's going to lead to more and more execution or more and more supplies as we move forward. But let's, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's wait for a couple of weeks and months, and then uh, potentially uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk to the market with respect to what we expect. With respect to FI27, in any case, we've already uh, we've set out a broader target of being a 2 gigawatt play. Uh, I mean... If the market is going to move towards 8 to 10 gigawatts per annum, which is what the expectation is, and that's that's broadly uh, a lot of the policy initiatives that the government is uh, acting upon, be it transmission, be it connectivity, if that plays out, then potentially we could be larger than that as we move forward. All right, so interesting times, and this is something that the investor community will track very closely. Devansh, uh, thank you so much for joining in today uh, with your take on quarter two numbers and most importantly, the outlook going forward. That's the word coming in from Inox Wind. The stock is up around 6% on the back of strong set of numbers. Time for a short break now. We'll get you more on the market on the other side of the short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Let's get you a CNBC TV 18 exclusive now. The RBI governor, Shakti Kanta Das, has been ranked as the top central banker by US-based global finance magazine. My colleague, Malvika Jain, met with him in Washington, D.C., and the governor sounded optimistic about growth. He said that inflation has started moderating. However, there are significant risks to the outlook on inflation. Listen in. Inflation management by stability is our primary responsibility, keeping in mind the objective of growth. At the moment, as we stated in the last monetary policy statement, as I have said, the growth and inflation component of our mandates are well balanced. They are well poised. That, so therefore, we changed our stance to neutral. Now we have flexibility. We have now flexibility to watch the incoming trends and to sort of assess the evolving outlook and decide on what policy we will take. Now growth is doing well. Inflation also has started moderating and we expect the inflation to moderate as we go into December, November, December and into the last quarter, last quarter of this financial year. We expect the inflation to moderate, but then there are significant risks. I have stated it in my monetary policy. Right. Significant risks again arising out of geopolitical conflicts, out of geoeconomic fragmentation, weather related events and you know, certain data which was released by the FAO with regard to food commodities and by the World Bank with regard to certain, certain commodities like metal prices and all, they have shown quite a bit of uptake. So, therefore, there are significant risks to the inflation outlook. We expect and we are reasonably confident that inflation is moderating, but then there are significant risks. So, we have to be very careful. And we are in such a place, you know, such a position where growth and inflation is so sort of well balanced that any premature move can upset that balance and, uh, you know, can affect uh, our objective of uh, achieving an inflation to reach the target of 4% or go close to 4% target. 
So, sir, if I could summarize that, uh, you feel that the growth momentum will continue and inflation is likely to come down. That's right. And until and unless there are some external factors which are beyond uh, the control of the domestic economy, we could see a rate cut in the coming year. No, rate cut, when it will come, I would not like to cut. <laughs> okay. I think that we give away. And again, in all seriousness, I think it depends on the incoming data. And based on the incoming data, the, what kind of assessment, what kind of outlook? Because inflation, uh, you know, policy, monetary policy making is always forward looking. Right. We have to see what is the situation six months down the line, down the road. What is the situation one year down the road? So based on that, we, you know, we determine and decide the future outlook. So based on that assessment, we will take a decision. I cannot give as to when we will do a rate sure. cut or uh, we will not do a rate cut. I cannot say. We expect inflation to moderate. We have to be very careful. We have to be very watchful of the evolving outlook. And we should not do, as I said again, I'm repeating, we should not do anything in a haste, which uh, will sort of again put us back in our objective of achieving the inflation target. In fact, it's it, interestingly, the household, uh, you know, the inflation expectations of households are also well anchored okay. at the moment because the household inflation expectations are, you know, moderating for almost uh, every round of survey. The household expectations are moderating by 10 or 20 basis points for the last uh, two years. So we are therefore very, we are very, uh, we are maintaining constant visit. We are watchful. We have to evaluate the risks and see how the risks are playing out. And based on that, when we have greater confidence of the inflation aligning with the target, that would be a time where we, you know, we will see. All right, you can hear views from the RBI, RBI governor on moderating inflation, but the risks around it on the domestic economy doing well and positive significantly outweighing the negatives when it comes to festive season demand. Catch excerpts from the exclusive interview all day today only on CNBC TV 18. Welcome back. Let's move on to stocks that have reported their Q2 earnings. Now, Interglobe Aviation reported their numbers. Revenues margins were largely in line with expectations. But on the bottom line, the company reported a loss after many quarters. Vinny now joins in with a review. The stock is down 8.5%. Vinny. Good afternoon. And not only 8.5%, at one point of time, it was down almost 10%, so which was the biggest intraday fall that we've seen for the company in almost two years. Loss surely is the main reason that we're seeing uh, the big miss coming in on 988 cross is the loss versus a profit of 188 cross. So this is uh, a loss that the company is reporting uh, after seven quarters that the company has actually reported a loss. When you look at the revenue growth number, 13.5%, now that also, when you look at it, that's the slowest growth that the company has seen in almost 14 quarters mainly the impact is coming in of grounding of aircrafts then they are talking about fuel costs which has seen an increase of around 12.8 percent on a year on year basis and repair and maintenance cost also seeing at around increase of 29.6 percent forex coming in forex loss of around 2400 crores so that is uh, all these segments that are impacting the bottom line of the company overall q2 let's not forget is also a weak quarter for the company now on the back of that we've seen brokerages have actually cut their target price and as Estimates. Uh, Kotak is maintaining their buy call, target price of 5,200, but they have lowered their 527 estimate by 10%. Goldman Sachs has cut the target price to 4,800 rupees per share, while Jefferies also has cut the target price to 5,100 rupees per share. So there is a bit of a pressure, not much. Uh, 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 positive signs or triggers that one is watching out for in terms of intergroup aviation going forward. But the management did highlight that they want to bring down the grounding of aircrafts to sub-40 by uh, the beginning of FI26. Currently, it's in high 60s, so let's keep an eye out on that. So, uh, Nuvama has downgraded the stock now to a hold. One, because the stock has been an outperformer, its valuations are higher than peers. And plus, there was this relentless promoter selling, which has been taking place in Interglobe Aviation. Valuations, as I said, unsupportive and slowing consumer demand. So, but it's a hold, you know, not uh, bearish, but uh, it's a hold now, downgrade. Okay, a big cut there, but we have a lot of stocks to talk about. Bandhan Bank, Yes Bank are in focus after quarter two numbers. Abhishek is joining us with the details. 
Uh, well, uh, Bandhan Bank, their asset quality saw minor blip over here, 4.68% gross NPA ratio versus 4.23% in the previous quarter. Deposit growth was pretty healthy at 7% quarter on quarter and management has guided that they will continue to focus on garnering uh, deposit and lowering the CD ratio as well to below 90% uh, to CNBC TV 18. AM growth was healthy at 21.5% YOI and about 4% sequentially. The net interest margin has dipped a bit, 20 basis point decline over there, but that's largely to do with the fact that you know deposit growth outpaced the loan growth. Uh, with respect to the PNL, uh, the NI is below our poll. However, the profitability is at 937 crore versus our poll of 888 crores. Uh, yes, Bank, the credit deposit ratio is at 35 quarter low of 84.8%. Uh, the cost to income ratio has remained elevated, but it continues to improve on a YOY and sequential basis. Uh, net interest margin has remained stable for them versus decline seen for many of the peers uh, at 2.4% versus 2.4% in the previous quarter asset quality has improved gross NP ratio is down by uh, 10 basis points sequentially while net NP ratio has remained stable at 0.5 percent with reference to the PNL the NIS below our poll by 50 55 crores however the part is ahead of our poll back to you okay let's uh, listen into some of the management commentary on these stocks we are getting okay. very good resolution on the top of it is KSK Mahanadi uh, where we are expecting uh, recovery of more than 100% recovery of principal amount we are expecting because uh, the Swiss challenge process is on and we are uh, the rates that uh, the bids that have come it is indicating that our recovery is going to be more than 100%. Second case is that of Sinner uh, plant at Nasik. There also the initial bids have come and the H1 bid is quite good. And third project is here in my project. There also, uh, uh, the Swiss challenge process has just been completed and the, uh, the bids that we have received, received is quite encouraging. Our spread has increased to 2.96% as compared to 2.73% uh, as compared to last year, a Q2 of FY24. Uh, this has, there is an increase of 23 basis point with regard to spread and our Net interest margin has also increased by 23 basis points from 3.41% to 3.64%. We hope to hold on to this net interest margin as spread because the set of these loans take place after a one year period. There might some there be some sliding down of the interest rate, but the reset will happen after one year. So at least till one year, this um, net interest margin and uh, spread will be able to hold on examined uh, that proposal and we did not find it feasible at this stage we don't have any expertise in telecom sector as i told you that our hands are full with all sector renewable energy sector and our priority is not the non-point for the logistics so at this stage we are not in a position to go ahead with any telecom uh, sector proposal at this stage well, that is the management of REC. They've seen a good jump in the company's net interest margin. Spreads also came in at a nine-quarter high. And the company said at least for the next one year, the NIMS and the spreads will remain at the same levels uh, as we've seen. Uh, we will, um, you know, on that note, slip into a very short break. We'll come back and get chatting with the management of Saskian Technology on their Q2 numbers. Stay tuned. We're going to win Arizona. We're going to defeat Kamala Harris. It's the election verdict the world is watching. Will Donald Trump reclaim the White House and become the oldest president to be sworn in? How will this U.S. election impact global trade and inflation? Will Kamala Harris make history becoming the first woman president of the United States of America? How will the next U.S. president deal with geopolitical volatility? What next for the India-U.S. relationship, the most defining partnership of the 21st century? What's CNBC TV 18 for the best newsmakers and the sharpest analysis? We bring you all the action live right here on CNBC TV 18.
Welcome back. Let's talk about Saskin Technology. Now, the company has reported a good revenue performance. The company's revenues went up by 9.5% quarter on quarter. Year on year, it was up 31%. But margins and profits came under pressure. Uh, to talk more about the way forward, we have with us Rajiv C. Modi, Chairperson and Managing Director CEO of Saskin Technologies on the show now. Thank you very much, sir, for joining in. Last quarter, you had told us that revenue growth will be sort of high single digits in the current quarter in September, and you've delivered on that. What is the visibility for Q3 and Q4 in terms of revenues? Because in the first half of the year, you've clocked in a top line of nearly 28%. Uh, morning, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for having us on, on your channel today. Uh, so... We do see continued momentum of, uh, of growth uh, continuing into quarter three and quarter four. So we are quite positive, bullish about uh, the, uh, the opportunities that are out there and our ability to service them. Uh, so I think to your question, yes, we see a sustained, uh, sustained momentum uh, uh, for, uh, on, on the growth vector in Q3. <laughs> Would so you be able to, sorry, would you be able to put a number to that or a range uh, in terms of sorry, Q3, Q4 revenues? I think we'll, we'll stay with the same what we said last time, maybe a, a single digit. Uh, now you can add the lower or the higher side of it to it, but we definitely feel comfortable, confident on delivering uh, the, uh, the growth vector that we are on. So the last time in quarter four, you told us it'll be mid to high teens revenue growth in FI25. Is this something that you are confident about? I think we are we are comfortable confident about uh, okay. about that. yes for the full year okay. numbers we have seen twenty eight and a half yearly basis and we do see the momentum continue on a full year basis also. Okay, but you know your margins have declined on a YY basis, Mr. Modi. You said short term investments may impact margins. So will quarter three continue to see a drop in margins? What led to a margin contraction in quarter two? I think uh, there are a few things that uh, we have kind of proactively invested in. One is our uh, Japan subsidiary. So we are uh, investing into growing our business in Japan. So that is one area that we will uh, we will monitor and ensure that it, it comes out of the investments and starts contributing to the margin. And the second thing is primarily the, uh, the freshers that we have inducted uh, in quarter three. Uh, that is, that is, uh, we have inducted about 90 freshers in quarter three. We see the growth momentum continue, and uh, towards that, we may see an impact because of that. But on all other vectors, I think we expect the margins to improve from here on as we are are delivering on our growth vector growth trajectory. How much have you invested so far in the Japanese subsidiary, and when will it start yielding results? And what could you end the year with in terms of margins? I think we expect the in quarter four Japan to kick in uh, and and be uh, uh, a bit positive. Uh, that's the vector that we are on. And on a full on a full year base, I mean, on the quarter four, we will definitely see uh, double digit uh, EBIT margins coming back. Hmm. So double digit margins in the second half, and you had given earlier the guidance that you will see around fourteen to fifteen percent exit margins in FY twenty five. So that is something which is achievable. That is correct. In quarter four, not in the second half, but in quarter four, we do expect the margins to improve uh, uh, in the double digits. Okay. So you have a 16 to 4 into 3 strategy that you're executing on. 60 right. stands for 60 marquee clients, 4 stands for $4 million per account, and this is in three years. Where okay. are we? Have you identified the 60 uh, clients? What is your current uh, revenue per client? I think uh, we have disclosed those uh, numbers in the in the uh, investors uh, presentation that we have made. To be honest, I may not recollect, but what I remember is 37 of the 58 customers that we have been working with have has shown uh, systematic growth quarter on quarter, and we are continuing on that momentum. By the way, we have close to 120 or 130 MSAs that we have, global MSAs with marquee customers. Our, uh, our uh, war cry is out of that, focus on 60, uh, or rather focus on all of them. Out of that, 60 will turn out to be in this range of at least 4 million. Don't drop below 4 million in, a, in, in any customer account. And we have three years timeline 
towards achieving that goal. We are seeing good traction, by the way, in the silicon business that we just started, and that has turned a bit uh, neutral, and going forward, it's going to turn a bit positive. So we are quite, quite uh, excited about the, the, the bets that we are taking, and they are really delivering us the results that we are expecting. Okay. Uh, so the Saskin Silicon is also contributing to your order wins. So your order wins in the current quarter were $11.5 million. Can you break it up in terms of services and products? I think uh, 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 it's, it's, we break it up in terms of new orders and, and uh, renewals. Uh, we had about 7.4 million of uh, new orders and remaining are, are renewals. We continue to see momentum on that and, and, and we, are, we are quite excited on what we will be delivered in quarter three. Okay, all right. Uh, Mr. Modi, thank you so much for joining in today with that uh, take on quarter two numbers and most importantly, the outlook going forward. That's the word coming in from uh, Saskin Technologies. The stock has recovered from the lows. It's up around 1.5% as we speak. Time for a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about more markets on the other side and some stock-specific action as well. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Bharti Airtel will be reporting their Q2 numbers post-market hours. This is a stock which has done very well. It's up 60% since the beginning of the year. Now, expect a strong quarter for Bharti Airtel this time. Uh, we'll put up the consolidated numbers first, and then I'll explain what will drive that. So on the top line, a 6% revenue growth quarter on quarter, margin expansion to 53%, and profit numbers closer to 4,350. As I said, expect a strong quarter because the India wireless business, the mobile business of India, which is 60% of the company's revenues in EBITDA, uh, has undertaken, will be boosted by the tariff hikes. The company undertook a tariff hike of nearly 15% in early July. So July, August, September will see a benefit of that. So if you look at the top line growth of 6%, it will be driven by a 10% quarter-on-quarter jump in the India wireless business. Even the EBITDA margin expansion is largely driven by the India wireless performance. The ARPU, which is a representation of the tariff hike, average revenue per user, that's also seen expanding by nearly 10%. Subscriber growth, though, may moderate a bit or according to some analysts, could remain flat. We saw that in the case of Reliance Geo 2, that there was a strong ARPU expansion, pricing expansion, but subscriber growth moderated. In fact, it declined on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, so that's something you need to track. And remember, Airtel Africa has already reported their numbers, so that's about 20-30% of their revenues in EBITDA. So that is out of the way. The focus is on the India wireless, and a strong quarter expected, largely on account of the tariff hikes undertaken by them. Okay, so tariff hikes to the rescue this time. That's about Bharti Airtel, but Sun Pharma will also be reporting its second quarter numbers. Winnie is joining in with what to expect. Winnie. So yes, this time from Sun Pharma, we are expecting a revenue growth of around 10%. Margins expected to see a very sharp improvement on a year-on-year -year basis. Around an 800 basis point improvement in terms of margins. EBITDA margin expected at 30% for the quarter. Profits also expected to see a growth of around 13%. When you look at it in terms of internals, domestic formulation uh, business of the company is expected to see a growth of high single digits. US business expected to come in somewhere around $480 million, which is an increase of around 10%. Um, Expansion, the potential expansion of uh, generic Revlimid is something that will be helping the US generic business. So let's keep an eye out, especially on the press release, because we'll be getting more details on that. Uh, other than that, EBITDA margin improvement is mainly because of specialty portfolio that started doing well. So that is expected to support the EBITDA margins. Uh, what are we watching out for in terms of outlook on margins as well as overheads, uh, the launch plans of the company, as well as in terms of um, outlook for the six products that are under development? Development. What is that? Where is which phase it is it on? Or what is further development on that front is something we're keeping an eye on. All right, Winnie, thank you so much for joining in with what to expect uh, from Sun Pharma. With that, we'll take your leave on this edition of Trading Hour with the news that the Nifty is still at the day's high and it is propelled by Bank Nifty, which is doing really well in trade today. Stay tuned, halftime report comes up next. <laughs> 